Folks, we are one day away from craziness in the kennel. Our first glimpse at the seven newcomers on Gonzaga's roster ahead of the upcoming season. What should we be looking for on Saturday? Let's discuss. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. Folks, it's here. Happy Craziness Eve for those of you listening on Friday. Happy Craziness Day for those of you listening on Saturday. We got all sorts of stuff to talk about today. We're going to talk about what to expect at Craziness in the Kennel, what things we should be looking for, recruits who are in town, updates we might get from the coaching staff, all of that good stuff. We're also going to close out the show discussing the new smaller transfer portal window uh, for men's basketball, women's basketball, and for football to close out the show and the week. So excited, folks. Craziness is finally here. The event will begin at 3 p.m. on Saturday. That's, of course, Pacific time. Uh, Tickets have sold out for anybody in the Spokane area hoping to go. You can try to look on the secondary market. Good luck if you are hoping to do that. Uh, the The doors open at 2 for anybody who is planning to go. But again, the event will begin at 3. For those in the Spokane area, you will be able to watch the game on SWX. For those outside the Spokane area, the game will be on ESPN Plus, so make sure you have that subscription. Not just regular ESPN, you do have to have a specific subscription for ESPN Plus, but for people who are college basketball junkies, ESPN Plus is absolutely awesome. You get tons and tons of different games all year long, Uh, so that's where the game's going to be televised. Uh, It's also going to be on the local Spokane radio stations as well. So what is craziness? And what is craziness going to be this year? Most of you who are listening to this podcast have probably been Gonzaga fans for a a lengthy period of time. You probably know a little bit about craziness in the kennel, but effectively, craziness is the first public practice of the year. Most college basketball programs have something like this. They usually have varying names for it. I think Duke's is Countdown to Craziness, so it's fairly similar to Gonzaga's, but it's, it's basically the first public practice, the first time fans are in the arena, the first real look that players get, or excuse me, that fans get at new players, at, you know, guys in new positions, the first look at just the team for that season. For Gonzaga, the way they've typically done this is they have some kind of featured games or or events or competitions, and then they have the scrimmage. The blue-white scrimmage is generally what people are, are coming to watch. It's usually 20 minutes long. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a full game. It's not a, a practice either. Mark Few's not stopping the game to to correct guys, to move guys around, to to teach the way that he does it at actual practices. Uh, it's It's just a scrimmage, effectively, for the fans to watch. And then again, before that, we'll have a three-point shootout tends to be one of the competitions that you see. Uh, they've done dunk contests in the past. They've done skills challenges in the past with like passing drills, shooting drills, various things like that. Kind of like that. Think think NBA All Star Weekend. Those kind of events, uh, but you know, in a much smaller scale uh, with a just one team, and you know, it doesn't take very long. The whole event's probably only going to be hour, maybe hour and a half long. Uh, so it'll be kind of quick. A few events, a, a scrimmage, some quotes from Mark Few and we will be out the door. Also, Nick Comenia will be in the house. Nick Comenia was there last year as well. He is a four-star prospect in the class of 2025. He came last year on an unofficial visit. We talked about it briefly on the show. Uh, He was AAU teammates with Colby Brooks. Uh, He had some familiarity with the program at the time he was, you know, a freshman in high school. Now he has ascended up to the four-star prospect status. Uh, He's a fairly well-regarded kid in the class of 2025 from Harvard Westlake High School, the same high school as Trent Perry, who we spoke about to lead off Thursday's episode of Locked on Zags. And this is Comedia's only official visit. 
on the books at this point. I think it's a, a pretty safe bet that Gonzaga is the heavy front runner at this point. The things can change. We're talking about a 2025 prospect, so there's still a lot of time to go, but he will probably be mentioned on the broadcast. He will probably be shown in the crowd if you're trying to wonder who that is. It's likely Nick Kamenia, and he's a potential future Zag and somebody who, who could be a pretty impactful player in this program. Now, getting into some of the other details. In the second segment, we are going to talk about each player on Gonzaga's roster and things we're going to be looking for and things we're going to be maybe expecting or not expecting. But I want to say this at the top. I wouldn't take a whole lot from this event particularly seriously, in part because Mark Few repeatedly says to not take things from this event super seriously. And I think that that's important. There are things we will look for, and there are things that we should take seriously, but for the most part, overreacting to performances in this scrimmage is probably not going to be all that productive. But that that said, you know, what roles guys play and things like that are going to be things we're watching for, things we're looking for. And again, we'll talk about that more in the second segment. But if Anton Watson shoots uh, two of two from three, I don't think that means that he's going to be a 40% three-point shooter next year. If he shoots 0 of five, that doesn't necessarily mean we should be panicking about that. It's similar to how we don't take one game sample sizes and extrapolate them over uh, a full season and, and have panic over that because that's just not – it's not fruitful. It's not helpful. And with a scrimmage like this, again, Mark Few is is letting the guys play for the fans. It is an event for the fans. And, and he will say that so many times on Saturday. That's what he typically does. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that. Doesn't mean we can't learn anything. Doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to certain things for those of us who, who like to kind of pay attention to those details and try to glean what we can from this event. But I would say on the whole, Think of it as more of an exhibition for the people in the arena and the people watching on TV and not as much a practice for Mark Few to really, you know, he's, he's not necessarily putting out every little secret about the team in this scrimmage because why would he, quite honestly? But... One thing that I do want to focus on, A, there's two things, I guess. I'm curious how the teams will be divided up. Again, I wouldn't take that super seriously, but it'll be interesting. And we'll talk about some of those things when we get to the individual players and kind of who they're matched up with, what what teammates they have, you know, whether Ryan Nembhard and Nolan Hickman are on the same team, like those kinds of things we'll talk about. But the other thing is simple. Take what Mark Few says seriously. Um, Mark Few, as many coaches are, especially long-term tenured coaches, He's very good at coach speak. Coach speak is effectively the ability to use a lot of words and not actually give a whole lot away. I covered Pete Carroll for three years when I was a writer for the Seahawks at USA Today, and Pete Carroll is legendary at the ability to speak a lot and speak honestly and truthfully and look you directly in the eye and you realize afterwards he didn't say anything. <laughs> he is very good at that. And Mark Few, who is less verbose in general than somebody like Pete Carroll, is also pretty good at not giving a whole lot away. But it means that what Mark Few does say should be taken even more seriously. Case in point, last year, unprompted, and that's key, unprompted, Mark Few and Brian Michelson talked about Ben Gregg. And I say unprompted as in they were not asked, what do you think about Ben Gregg's development? They were asked who on the team, you know, made big, the biggest strides this offseason. I think it was Greg Heister and Dicka who were asking those questions. And, and when the questions are more open-ended, it's important to pay attention to who they talk about. Because, again, being asked, how does Nolan, look, Nolan Hickman look this summer? Mark Fee's going to say, oh, he looked great. And I don't take that all that seriously. It doesn't mean he's looked bad. It just doesn't mean that much. But if he says, if somebody says, who you know made big strides this summer, who looked great working out this summer, and he says Nolan Hickman, that's going to mean a little bit more. Again, did it with Ben Gregg last year. Look what happened. Ben Gregg emerged as a third big, had a breakout season, is primed to be a really big piece for this team this year. In 2013, Mark Few said at Craziness in the Kennel that he thought Kelly Olenek was going to lead that team in scoring. Kelly Olenek had just come off a redshirt junior season. Nobody believed him. Kelly Olenek was then an All-American, still in the NBA because of that. So take those comments seriously. Again, with the understanding that we're paying attention to who Mark Few or Brian Michelson or Stephen Gentry or Zach Norvell or whomever gets, you know, gets some questions from Heister and Dickow and, and uh, on the broadcast, pay attention to who they talk about unprompted, because I do think that that could carry some weight. And then beyond that, of course, injury updates. We'll talk about that with some individual guys, but that's always going to be something that that you learn from this, who's healthy, who's maybe not healthy right now, what the timeline might be for those guys to return. 
So let's dive into the individual players. I'm going to talk about every player on the roster, things we might be looking for, again, with the caveat of how seriously we're taking any of those individual things. All that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best, most qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, because LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's super easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs, and then you just add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. From there, simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. Because honestly, Hiring the right team member can have a positive and measurable impact on your business. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. And a sincere shout out to my everyday listeners, those of you who have stuck with us through the off season. The basketball ended in March for Gonzaga. It is October. It has been a long, long off season. And many of you have been with us every step of the way. I'm so excited to be back talking actual hoops after this week. We got our season or our player preview series starting next week. We're gonna talk about every single player on Gonzaga's roster. They're all going to get their own individual show talking about their history, their best and worst case scenarios, laying out my predictions for how their minutes and production is going to look. It's going to be fantastic. Very excited about that. So stick with us here on Locked On Zags. But right now, speaking of talking about every single player on the roster, that's what we're going to do here in the second segment, breaking down what we're going to be looking for from each player at Craziness in the Kennel on Saturday afternoon, starting with the three scholarship returnees. We'll lead off with Anton Watson. Honestly, with Anton Watson, I'm looking for the beard. For those of you who has not, who did not see the reveal of the, the non-conference schedule for Gonzaga, it had a new picture of Anton Watson. He's rocking a beard this year. That's exciting. But in all seriousness, Anton doesn't need to prove anything. There's nothing that Anton could do or wouldn't do that would really move the needle in terms of how I feel about his production this upcoming season. Again, I used him as an example for a reason. Uh, if Anton Watson goes two of two from three, yeah, I think that's nice, and it's not a bad thing, but I also don't think it means a ton. If he goes 0 of 3, 0 of 5, again, not great, but does it mean a whole lot necessarily? I do want to see the outside shot. I want to see how comfortable he looks shooting it. I think it's something that's going to be a bit more a bigger element of his game this year. I think it's important for Gonzaga to have him be able to space the floor, and when we saw him improve to 33% last year. Still not great, but better than he's been in the past. That said, not necessarily paying attention to his percentages, more as his willingness to take those shots in this scrimmage game. Moving on to Nolan Hickman. The biggest thing I care about with Nolan Hickman is whether he's on the same team as Ryan Nembhard. Practically, in terms of building even rosters, it makes the most sense for Nembhard and Hickman to not be on the same team. And that's what I expect. But Nolan Hickman's probably going to play an off-ball role this year. He's not going to be the primary point guard. Ryan Nembhard is the primary point guard. He's one of the best point guards in college basketball. So Hickman is going to play off the ball. We may not get to see that in this scrimmage. And again, that's not a big deal, but I would like to. It would be nice if Nembhard and Hickman were on the same team. Again, it's maybe not fair from, a, uh, from the perspective of having even rosters, but I would rather see Hickman adjust that. And heck, maybe Hickman and Nembhard will be on different teams and Hickman won't run the point. That would be notable because I do think Hickman is the backup point guard on this roster. I think any minutes that Ryan Nembhard is not on the floor are probably going to be minutes where Nolan Hickman is playing the one. But if maybe Hickman's on the team with Dusty Stromer and Stromer's running the one, maybe Luka Kradnovich runs the one, those would be things that would be interesting to see how they shake out. Ben Gregg is next. Ben Gregg, let's look at how he looks. Does he look stronger? Does he look more physical? Because last year he made a noticeable physical difference. And that was what the staff talked about. That was what uh, kind of got brought up when I when I mentioned Mark Few talking about Ben Gregg. He looked noticeably stronger, uh, more muscular. Just he looked like he grew into his body a little bit. 
does he look like that again this year? The reports, all we have to go on right now are the, the, the glimpses we've seen on social media, as well as uh, the report that he gained some weight according to his weight last year and his weight this year on the roster. Things that I don't know how scientific that necessarily is. But if Ben Gregg looks even more filled out, even more physical, I think that's a really good sign for his production this season. Other than that, decision-making, defensive rotations, things that he's still kind of you know, wasn't perfect at last year. You wouldn't expect a guy with, you know, he didn't have a ton of playing time under his belt. I think we're going to see him make big strides in those kind of areas this year because he has, you know, a full season of consistent minutes under his belt. Again, how much of that we glean from a 20 minute scrimmage is probably not all that much, but it's something I'm going to be keeping an eye on with him kind of throughout the early part of the season. Moving on to the transfer additions, starting with Ryan Nembhard. Just enjoy it, folks. There's not a whole lot we need to see from Ryan Nembard. He doesn't need to prove anything. He's a Big East Rookie of the Year. He's a, a all WCC candidate to be a not just a first teamer, potentially the Player of the Year. Uh, we know, you know, we've seen him at Creighton. He's not the same player as his brother, but at the same time, I think there are going to be some similarities in terms of their ability to push the pace, uh, get out in transition, run the pick and roll, navigate that stuff. I think there's going to be a bit more pressure. On, on Ryan to score the way that Andrew didn't have because he played with Drew Timmy and he also played with Chad Holmgren and, and Barry and Jalen Suggs. And I think Ryan's going to have a bit more scoring pressure on him this season. But in terms of watching him in this game, I'm curious which starters he plays with. That's something I'll be looking for. Does he play with Graham E.K.? Does he play with Steel Venters? Does he play with Nolan Hickman, as we talked about previously? But I'm not really... There's not a whole lot of scrutinizing I'm going to be doing with his performance because we know who he is and we know he's pretty dang good. Moving on to Graham E.K., biggest thing here is the health. I know people have brought it up. We talked about it on Mailbag Monday. I've had messages from people concerned about, is is Graham going to play? Is he healthy? And we don't know. This is something, this is probably the biggest thing we will learn on Saturday. If Graham E.K. shows up at the arena in a boot, Mark Feud's going to get asked about it. He's going to have to talk about it. If if Graham E.K. shows up not in a boot or shows up and plays, then we don't have much to worry about. You know, you're still going to want to watch, like, how does he move? How does he look? I'm curious to see how he looks defensively. If he does play, is he going to be, how does he look on switches, playing defense away from the rim? How does he look as a rim protector? He's six foot nine, but he's got a big wingspan. He wasn't a great rim protector at Wyoming, but that may change at Gonzaga. So those are things I'll look for if he's playing, but certainly the biggest thing with him is just an update on his health. How how is he ready to go to start the season? Is he going to miss time? Anything like that? Uh, that's kind of the biggest takeaway we're probably going to get out of craziness uh, this, this, this go round. Next up, Steel Venters. How does he look on defense? That's something I'm curious about. And again, you know, if he... Uh, He's going to be guarding players he's familiar with, guarding guys he's been going up against in practice. It's much different than playing defense in a real game. Uh, But I am curious about that because Steele's kind of been billed as this one-trick pony. He's a good three-point shooter. That's kind of his main role for, for Gonzaga. But this guy was the big sky player of the year. And for me, I'm curious how he adjusts to going from being like, you know, the the number one guy on the uh, on the, the opposing defense's scouting report to being just a guy third option on offense, at times maybe the fourth option on offense. That's an adjustment. Many guys have come to Gonzaga and thrived when they made that adjustment. Ryan Woolridge comes to mind. He was fantastic about that. Um, their receiver Bolton was fantastic about that. And you have Malachi Smith, who it took him a little bit more time. He got great at it. But early in the season, he was a little inconsistent. And I think part of that was adjusting for him. It was coming off the bench. Steel, I expect to start. But how does he adjust to being in a different role than he was at Eastern Washington. We're not going to learn a whole bunch about that in this particular event, but it is something I am curious to see for him going forward. Moving on to the freshmen and the newcomers, Jun Sakio, again, not a freshman, but a newcomer to the in terms of getting to play this year uh, and a first-timer at Craziness in the Kennel. We're looking for everything, everything. I just want to watch Jun Sakio play basketball. I'm, I'm going to try not to overreact. If he comes out and leads his team in scoring and is fantastic and is hitting threes and driving to the rack like – I'm going to try to tell you all to not overreact, but it's going to be hard not to because that's going to be awesome if we see stuff like that from him. Likewise, if he really struggles, if he looks a little lost, uh, if he doesn't make his shots, you know, try not to overreact to that either, although it will be difficult not to. This There's a lot of hype about who Jun Sakio could be for this team. So of all the players on this team, he's going to be the most difficult to not have a strong reaction based on how he performs. 
Dusty Stromer, I'm curious what role he plays, and it'll depend on what team he's on. And again, the caveat will be that he's, you know, if he's playing point guard or playing the two on a roster that, you know, doesn't have the full picture of Gonzaga's team because half of them are on the other side. That is hard to know what exactly that means, but I am curious. Are they going to use him as a ball handler? Is he going to play primarily the wing? Is he going to look more like Steel Venters or Julian Strother? Is he going to look more like, you know, Hunter Salas last year where he kind of played the point coming into the games? Like that's the biggest thing I'm looking for with Stromer. Does he run pick and rolls? Does he attack the basket? Does he look more like a spot up shooter? Uh, And then defensively, just how do his instincts look? How comfortable does he look on the defensive end of the floor? Freshmen tend to be bad at defense, no matter how well they're billed. Gonzaga has been spoiled by the fact that three of their recent freshmen have been Jalen Suggs and Chet Holmgren and Hunter Salas. So those guys were all very good right away defensively. But I think expecting big things from freshmen on the defensive end of the floor is a bit risky. Um, But that said, I am curious how Dusty looks, at least in in the glimpses we'll get in this performance. Next up, Luka Krajnovic. What role does he play? How many minutes does he play? Again, I don't think we can glean everything from this, but if Dusty Stromer plays twice as many minutes as Luka Krajnovic, that probably doesn't mean nothing. Likewise, if Krajnovic plays a lot more than Dusty, that probably means something too. May not mean everything, but it's it's noteworthy. With Krajnovic as well, he's only been on campus for like a month. He's only been a, a Gonzaga commit for a month. How familiar is he with the offense? He's probably not there yet. If he looks really comfortable, that may mean something. If he looks completely lost, I wouldn't panic about that but because it's not that surprising considering how recently he's been here. But I think the hope of him being a a key rotation piece would probably dampen a little bit if he looked uncomfortable or unfamiliar with the offense. So that'll be what we're looking for there. Braden Huff, next guy up here. Does he, what role does he play in the front court? If they run a high-low offense, is he playing the high man? Is he playing the low man? Again, it'll depend on his teammates, but that's something I'm curious about because he's a guy who is 6'10". He's one of the biggest players on the roster, but he was also billed as an outside shooter coming out of high school. Can he be a stretch four, stretch five, or is he going to be playing back to the basket, posting up, looking for touches down on the block? And then defensively, same thing. How does he look in space? Can he navigate hedging screens? Are guards going to just pick him apart? Those are things, again, you only learn so much from a scrimmage, and I know I've said that a handful of times, but it's important to acknowledge. But with with Huff, I am curious, like if he looks like a complete anchor down low and his, his timing is good, he's blocking shots, he's rotating well, that could lead to him playing more minutes. Similarly, if he looks completely lost defensively and is getting put on skates by, by Gonzaga's guards, that's probably a, a sign that he's still got some work to do on that end of the floor. Pavel Stoschitz is next, and really, I just want to see how comfortable he looks. He just got here. He's probably not super familiar with the offense yet. It takes time. I mean, it takes a long time to get familiar with this offense, so he's probably not going to be there yet. But what we do see, how comfortable is he taking shots? How comfortable is he moving without the basketball? How does he look defensively? I'm not expecting much from him this year. In fact, I am expecting him to not play this year. I think he's going to be a redshirt but it'll be interesting to see what role he does play when he's on the floor and how comfortable he looks. And then of course there's the walk-ons, Colby Brooks, Joe Few, Q. Just want to see them get a chance. Just want to see them on the floor. Not really looking for anything in particular. It's just fun to see those guys get a chance to play. And like we said, this is a fun event. So getting to see these guys go out and have fun is the key thing coming out of craziness this year. We're going to close up the show discussing the new transfer portal window, which shrank to 45 days, but is still opening the day after selection Sunday. We talk about why that might be after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Snap into the action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 back in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the MLB action. The app is super easy to use. You can bet on all sorts of stuff like spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel an official partner of the NFL. All right, folks, closing out the show and the week and the final episode before we got some real Gonzaga basketball to play at Craziness in the Kennel. We're talking about the NCAA, the Division I Council. They met in Indianapolis and discussed a handful of rule changes, most notably shrinking the transfer portal window. And the window was put into place just last year. It was a first-time thing. 
And now they have decided to lower the amount of days that players are eligible to enter the transfer portal. Players do not need to have committed to a new school by the time that this window closes, but they need to have put their name in the portal. Last year was 60 days. This year it's 45. And there was a big push from NCAA, from men's basketball coaches, men's and women's basketball coaches, and, and people in the industry to bring this down to 30. That was the big push. This should be 30 days instead of 60 days. However, the players pushed for 45, understandably. They want more time to make those decisions. And the NCAA sided with the players. I'm fine with 45 days. 60 was probably too long. 45 is a compromise. It's it's fine. I don't think that this is a a bad decision. I don't think it was debt. We desperately needed 30. I know some people feel very strongly about that. I don't think it's a huge deal. I do wish that it wasn't still the day after selection Sunday when this rule went into effect. For football, there's two windows, and there, so it's a little bit different to judge uh, for other sports. It's, it's, it's different in other sports. But for men's basketball and women's basketball, again, this will go into effect the day after selection Sunday. So players will have 45 days from that date to decide if they want to enter the transfer portal. If your team goes to the Final Four or goes to the National Championship, pretty much half of that time, you will be still playing basketball. You won't want to be thinking about whether you're going to transfer. Your coaches don't want you thinking about that. Your family presumably doesn't want you thinking about that. Or if they do, you probably don't want your family badgering you about that. But it's hard to not be thinking about that, especially if you know there's a ticking clock. So to me, you're, you're basically punishing student athletes who are on good teams by giving them less time to make this decision. Granted, teams that go to the Final Four and go to the National Championship are probably going to have less players transfer out. Doesn't mean they will have zero, but it is probable that they will have less. It is also probable, again, uh, this is not data that we have, although you could probably pull it, it, it makes sense that the players who do choose to leave programs that go to the Final Four or the National Championship, those players may have kind of already made their mind up ahead of time. You know, I think about Dominic Harris, who, again, I, I don't know when he made the decision to leave Gonzaga, um, but it's, it's possible that he had had in mind that he was going to enter the transfer portal and didn't make that decision like right after the season ended. He may have known that ahead of time. It's possible Hunter Salas and, and Efton Reed knew that ahead of time, too. Who knows? But I don't like that basically players who advance farther have this really shrinking amount of time where they get to make this decision. Is it a huge deal? Probably not. Is it going to cause a bunch of issues? Eh, probably not, but it's not great. Also, it puts more pressure on coaches who are coaching in the NCAA tournament. Again, players don't have to commit within this 45-day window. So you can enter the transfer portal on day one and wait to commit until way, way, way later if you want to. Months and months later, you can leave the transfer portal on day 45 and commit on day 46. Totally up to you. Those are those are reasonable options. But when good players enter the portal, coaches who are in the NCAA tournament are going to want to contact them. If it's a player that Gonzaga wants, they're not going to be like, well, we'll just wait to contact him until after the tournament. They're going to contact them before then because they want to make sure that player knows, hey, I'm interested in you. Because if, you know, if said player enters, you know, a player leaves UW, uh, because they don't make the tournament and Mike Hopkins gets fired. It's a hypothetical, but let's let's run with it because, frankly, it's not that unrealistic. Player leaves UW. They enter the transfer portal. It's a player Gonzaga wants. They can't just wait. They have to contact him because said player might want to come to Gonzaga, but he may not think they're interested, so he may say, okay, well, I'm going to go to Texas Tech or I'm going to go to you know wherever, West Virginia, some team that didn't make the tournament or that's already out of the tournament because they reached out. They contacted me. Gonzaga can't let that happen. Similarly, UConn, all those other programs who might be deep in the NCAA tournament, they can't let that happen. So they got to split focus. In 2022, I was at the NCAA tournament uh, when Gonzaga played Memphis in Portland. While at that game, waiting for it to start in the media room, I was writing an article about Fardaz Amac, who had entered the transfer portal out of Utah Valley. Amac, of course, went to Texas Tech, entered the portal again and went to Cal. He wasn't going to come to Gonzaga because Drew Timmy was still in the picture and he didn't know if Drew Timmy was going to come back or not. But I was thinking while I was there, I'm at a tournament game and I'm writing about a player in the transfer portal. If I'm splitting focus, how, what is this doing to the coaching staff? I don't think Mark Few was in the huddle there getting ready for Memphis thinking about Fardaz Amac, but somebody in his staff probably was. And I just don't like that. I don't love that that has to happen. Again, 
not a massive, like, we need to revolt against this type of thing. I think it's fine. I think it's understandable why, you know, teams that finish their season in early March, these players don't want to wait around for weeks and weeks and weeks before figuring out where they want to go to school next. I get that. I understand that. But there is some, some challenges with the way this is currently set up. Last thing I'll say here, grad transfers eventually are going to be subject, subjected to the same windows. Uh, and I think this is probably a good thing, but there are some questions about how this is going to work. Right now, grad transfers can basically enter the portal whenever. We saw it create some really weird situations this year where players were entering the transfer portal like in September. Very baffling that players were able to do that. They were all grad transfers. It was within the rules. I can see why they're changing that. What about players who graduate in the summer? We we'll use the UW example. You finish your fourth year of college, you decide you're transferring away from UW, and you got one class left before you graduate. You take that class over the summer, you finish that class, now you have a degree. Are you saying you can't transfer now? That means you're basically punishing players for getting their degree. That doesn't feel right. There are some things that might need to be, and I don't, I, I'm, I don't know what the rule will be on that. If you do get your degree, maybe you then get a window open after that. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work. I also understand why if you, you know, finish a summer class in August and then enter the portal, that's kind of screwing over the team too. So there are some things about that that need to get figured out. I, I don't think that these rules are finalized. They're going to be changed. They're going to be adjusted going forward. But I think ultimately, the decision to shrink the transfer portal window, the decision to make grad transfers subjected to the same rules is probably a net good. It's just going to come with some wrinkles that are going to need to be ironed out. That's going to do it for us today, folks, here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Last episode before we got real basketball to talk about. So excited to come back with you next week. We'll do a mailbag post-craziness edition, and then we're going to get straight into those player profiles, talking about every single team on the roster. So if you haven't yet, subscribe on YouTube. That's a great way to make sure you get access to every single show as it goes live. Uh, you can also leave a review on iTunes. You can uh, follow on Twitter if you don't do so yet. We appreciate every single one of you for jumping on the show, whether it's your first time, 10th time, 150th time listening. It is fantastic to have you here. So excited to be talking real Zag hoops soon. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, go Zags.